Well, good morning, South Union, and welcome back to another wonderful Lord's Day. Welcome to each and every one of you who are here with us today. Welcome to all of our guests and all those listening in online now or at a later time. Welcome. Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace. We thank you so very much, Father God, for you. We worship you and we honor you and we praise you. We thank you that you are creator of all things and creator of the universe. We thank you that you are the creator and author of life. Father, we thank you most of all for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Jesus, we thank you that you have come to this earth to teach us about you. That you died on the cross to make atonement for our sin. And that you rose on the, from the dead on the third day. We thank you. Father, in Jesus, we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit, whom you have sent to us to dwell in us like a temple. We thank you. Father, now as we turn in this time to your word, we pray that you might speak to each and every one of us here this morning, that you would give us a word of instruction or teaching or encouragement, You would give us a word of rebuke or correction. And most of all, you would give us a word of edification and help us to live for you. In your name do we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. The end times have been a cultural occupation and fear for dozens of years in the United States. Fear of death expressed in a deep fear and fascination of death and life after death, comes out in zombie apocalypse movies, for example. Among evangelical Christians, the Left Behind series, preoccupation with the rapture, and attempts to map out the end times have all been expressions of a fear of, longing for, or passion for the end times. Wherever we may be along this spectrum of opinion or fascination with the end times, Paul makes, sets out to make one thing absolutely clear in our text today. Since Jesus has been raised, everyone will be resurrected with an emphasis on this text, on the hope of those faithful believers that they will be resurrected in Christ. I want you today to be encouraged, built up, and enthused believers in the resurrection. Our context for today in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is an ongoing discussion or an ongoing um, monologue regarding the resurrection. Previously and last week, we saw, especially with the focusing on verses 12 through 19, we saw Paul laying out the disastrous consequences if there is no general re resurrection and the disastrous consequences of that. And now Paul in the text is turning to the certainty of the resurrection. So let's keep our Bibles open and dive in here to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Paul is using this metaphor of first fruits with, with intention and with purpose. In the Old Testament, the first fruits were the first portion of the crop harvested, which was then given to God or laid aside and set out for the, um, for specifically for the Levites and the priests, but it was meant to be given to God. 
First fruits indicated that they were the first chronologically, meaning temporally in time, they're the first. Second, they are the first, they are a representation of the larger whole. The first fruit offering is never just the larger whole and everything together. The first fruit is the, the first of a larger whole, meaning that also it, it embeds in it not just a representation of the larger whole, but it's a bit of a promise that more of the same is to come. Do we understand that? The first fruit is always a promise that more of the same is going to be coming along. And so we see this, and Paul is using it as a, as a metaphor for the resurrection. Christ is the first fruit. He's utterly and totally, he's the Messiah, he's the King, he is the Son of God, and he is utterly and totally given to God. But what he's going to be doing is bringing others along with him. Now we saw this last week in our text, actually, the resurrection of Jesus is going to be much the same as sin and death was in Adam. And Paul actually goes here in verses 21 and 22. For as by a man came death, by a man also comes the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And so we see that logic, and we went over it last week. It's also in Romans chapter 5, and that's where we touched base on it. But the logic is, since um, just as in Adam, sin spread to all humanity and death spread to all humanity, so now since Christ is resurrected, all people will be resurrected. Now, Paul is emphasizing here those resurrected in Christ. We need to remember and we need to recall Revelation chapter 21. And if you want to touch base with me there so you can see it again, you can. Um, I'm sorry, not Revelation 21. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. He says this, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And so we see again, just as a recap, that there is a resurrection of all. There's a resurrection of believers in Jesus unto eternal life. There is the resurrection of of the wicked, the wicked include, or, or just everybody who does not believe in Jesus, okay? The resurrection of the wicked unto eternal damnation in hell, okay? And so those are the two resurrections. Um, we call them two, but it's really just the resurrection of all humanity. And those are the two fates of people in them. And so this is what Paul is indicating for us in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 20, verses uh, chapter 15, verses 20 and 22. And we are meant to take encouragement and edification because we are those who believe. And so we are meant to grab a hold of this in confidence and look forward to it with pleasure and go through this life in joy. Why? Not because everything is perfect here on earth, but because we look forward to it for everlasting life in the resurrection. And that's what we grab a hold of uh, and onto, and that's what brings us um, through this life and carries us through this life, is that heavenly expectation and joy. So let's then look in verse 23. But each in his own order... Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Part of what, what, what's going on here is, is it says Christ is the first and then everyone else, but all events are to happen in an ordered fashion. 
And Christ's resurrection in the middle of history was not something that was outside of God's plan. That was the plan all along. And then those who are in Christ will be resurrected when Jesus comes again, right? And every event is mapped out by God from then to eternity, right? And we could say all, all of time was mapped out by God, but the text is simply ordering it from Christ the first fruits to those who belong to him. Now, what does this mean? If, because we need to look at the text carefully, it says, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Notice the order, and this is specifically talking about the resurrection. So what does it mean? Actually, what the text is saying here is that Christ is resurrected, but then those who believe in him will be resurrected when he comes again. Now, wait a second. We believe in life after death. We believe that as soon as somebody dies, if they're a Christian, they go to be with God. How does this work? Well, let's turn with us to John chapter 11. In verse 25, you'll see that laid out quite clearly. <clears throat> John chapter 11 is, of course, the famous uh, raising of Lazarus from the dead. And in verse 25, we see, her, we see Jesus in discussion with Mary. And Jesus says this to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Right? And so we, we have this statement by Jesus, and it's an incredible statement that those who believe in him will never die. It means that they'll never taste death. And Paul himself will talk about that a little later on in 1 Corinthians 15. And yet this text in 1 Corinthians 15 is also saying that the resurrection will only happen when Jesus comes again. So what do we see? Actually, N.T. Wright in his book, Surprised by Joy, simply labels it like this. As Christians, we believe in life, after life, after death. We believe in life, after life. What does that mean? It means that when we die, if we are Christians, we are with Jesus. We are with God. Amen and hallelujah. Yet the resurrection happens later on. Okay. How does all that work? I'm not going to make any, any specific claims today on how all that works. I'm just saying here's what the text lays out for us. Okay. Um, and so we, we have this expectation that the resurrection happens when Christ comes again. Yet we are alive with God after death. Very good. Let's move into our practical application for those set of verses then. It's this. We have a rock-solid hope in the resurrection. We have a rock-solid hope in the resurrection. When we speak of our hopes, we very often talk about hopes and dreams in English. Very often. We, we might even ask people, what are, what are your hopes and dreams? And, and dreams are very sort of vague, amorphous, almost shadows, right? There are things that we can, we're hoping to reach for, we might strive to, but we may never actually enter into them. It's a far off state. And sometimes we have that hope way out there as well, right? Like 90% of the time I'm hoping for pizza for dinner, but 85% of the time I'm going to be wrong, <laughs> Right? There, there's, there's a hope, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to come true. Um, those with, with kids may also identify that the kids have hopes, don't they? Especially coming around Christmas time. My son is starting to ask for, for all of these different things on this Christmas list. And the amount of big things that are over $100 just keeps growing. And I'm like, you can hope for them, bud, but just want to let you know you're not going to be getting all those things. We, we think of hope like in that language. When, I, when, when Christians speak of hope in the resurrection or hope in life after death, it is a rock-solid hope. It is a fact 
The hoping part is just the waiting part. It's very, very different from how we use it in English. Again, the hoping part is just the waiting part. That's it. Why is it rock solid fact? Why is the resurrection something that we can certainly grab a hold of? It's because it's already happened in Christ. Not the general resurrection of the dead, but specifically Christ is already raised from the dead. Since he is already raised from the dead, the general resurrection, life after death, is certainly going to happen. It's just a matter of when. That is the, so when we speak of this hope, we've got to speak of it in a rock-solid hope. And it's going to impact how we live. Now, I, want to, I don't want to go into the impact of how, how we live too much, because that's next week's sermon. But it's going to deeply impact how we live. But not only this, the resurrection is also tied to God's complete victory over all things. Which again is a rock solid hope. When we look around the world around us, we, we see so many things that may need correction. We see so many things to be anxious about. We see so many things to hurt over. We just long for Christ to come and go, when will you, when will you get all of these bad and evil rulers out of here? Right? You know, just, just recently, and, and the, the one that's heavy on my mind from last night and the one that's heavy on my mind is just Putin calling up all of these reserve armies to, to go at it again in Ukraine. And I just go, when's enough enough? You know, relating it to something we'll speak about later today, evil rulers who say that people can have abortions any point along the spectrum. What in the world? And there are those people. When will God get them out? When will God set th all things right? And I do mean all things. Let's take a look here. Verse 24. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. What's the end? The end is not the end of us. The end is simply the end of this age. And it happens when Jesus comes and he will destroy every rule and every authority and every power. What's included in that? Well, it includes supernatural entities. It includes human rulers. It includes governments. It's, it includes everything that stands up against God. And Jesus comes and destroys it all. And does what? He delivers the kingdom to God the Father. Now, verse 25 then is also filled with even more hope. Look at verse 25 with me. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. What's fascinating about this is, is the language here. Let's break it down just a little bit. For he must reign. It means that he is reigning and he will reign until he conquers and vanquishes all enemies. What happens then? The son hands over the kingdom to the father. Okay, so that, that's what's happening. But we have, to, we have to have this assurance. Jesus is king over his kingdom right now. He is ruling. He must reign. There's no other possibility. There's nothing else that could be happening. There's, oh, excuse me. There's only one person on the throne. And that's Jesus. Only one person. He's currently ruling and reigning. Now there are some fascinating things here. And, and one of them is that he's going to put all enemies under his feet. We've seen that. He's going to destroy all things. Look here in verse 26. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Here's the question. How does death die? 
We, we heard and we saw in Revelation chapter 20 that death personified is thrown into the lake of fire. It's an image of death being eternally judged. It's an image of death being destroyed. But how does it actually die? The death of death can only come by eternal life, which is why the resurrection must include eternal bodies. You understand that? The only way for death to die is if everything else lives eternally. That is how death dies. And so death must be destroyed. And that enemy is that, that, that conquering. Jesus conquers that enemy when he comes. He's already conquered, already has the keys of death in Hades. But it will be vanquished once and for all by eternal life. Verse 27. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are in subjection, it is plain that he is, he is accepted who puts all things in subjection under him. Here, if you have a Bible that has footnotes, you'll see um, a little A at the beginning of verse 27. And it should um, launch you down to the bottom and you'll see Psalm 8, 6. And what this is, it's, it's a quotation of Psalm verse eight or chapter 8, verse 6. So let's head there very quickly. And I just want to say that, that what Paul is doing here is, is, is he's saying that Christ is actually fulfilling the mission given to humanity. Christ is fulfilling them. Remember in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, what happens is that um, God gives to humanity the reign and rule over the fish and the birds and, and the animals and, and everything in the sea. He, he brings it and he says, this is all under your dominion. But then with sin, issues came about. We no longer ruled as we should. We no longer imaged God as we should. We weren't Christ-like. We were wicked and, and the flood came and all of that sort of stuff. And so there is still in the text, even from the beginning, this longing to see that humans were exalted to their proper place under God and fulfilled that dominion function. In Psalm verses, uh, chapter 8, verse 6, here's what it says. I'm going to back up to verse 5 to give us a running start. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. You crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And so we see here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is talking and, and putting this text of Psalm 8, verse 6, with its dominion mandate as being accomplished and fulfilled by Jesus. God put all things in subjection in, under, under dominion of Christ. And so we see here the fulfillment. Now, there's also another part of this text that Paul is using, although he's only alluding to it. He is not quoting it, but that's Psalm 110.1. Now, Psalm 110.1 is very often used by early Christians. It's very often used in the New Testament. It's one of the go-to texts. And here's what it says. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And hopefully we, we hear that resounding. We kind of are familiar with it. We go, oh, okay, this is the text that Peter uses. And this is the text that Jesus uses when he's, when he's tackling the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he gives them this riddle. He says, how does David say, my Lord said to my Lord? Well, how do, and, and Jesus uses that to prove that he's the Messiah. And so he's, Paul is alluding to this text and saying, the Lord is saying to the Messiah, I have put all things under subjection to you. And so we see here that Jesus is conquering and God is, is on Jesus' side, right? The Father and the Son are aligned. And in verse 27, God has put all things in subjection under his feet, except for himself. Now, how does this work? Let's look at verse 28. 
When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. What do we see here? We see Jesus coming and conquering all enemies. Jesus is the Son of God. Yet the Father is also working in and through and with Jesus so that the text can say, God put all things under subjection to him. Okay? The two are aligned. Now what happens? Jesus turns all this over to the Father in humble and loving submission, just as all things should be, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, we do have to go into a little bit of, of theology so we don't make some further errors here. Number one, this text does not say that they are not co-equal. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are always co-equal with each other. Submission does not imply, imply inequality. Okay? So we, we, we're going to... I'm digging a hole. I can just tell by people's faces. I'm digging a hole. We're going to dig a little bit further because it's important. This text is not about the study of beings or, or what something is. Okay? It's simply saying how things are and some of the relations between them. Okay? Let me, let me try to uh, uh, get this real quick. Um what something is. This pulpit is wood. It's what something is. I'm a human being. This pulpit, though, is a tool. The relationship between me and it is it's a tool for me to use. In 1 Corinthians 15, it is not talking about what God is. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are of, of one substance. They're all, the, they're all the same. They're the Godhead. They're one, and they're three persons in that one. Okay? This text is talking about the relationship between them. Jesus is the conquering king. God is coming and working with and through and in Jesus and putting all things in subjection under him. When he does that, Jesus then turns and turns everything back over to God the Father and is subjected to God the Father. It's the difference between what something is and the relationship between them. All right, we're going to leave that there. We'll try to come back in a Sunday school class and, and, and get that worked out. But that's what's happening here within the text. Okay, now there's one final piece that we then need to bite off here. It says this, that God may be all in all. What does that mean? It does not mean pantheism. It doesn't mean that God is within everything, as if God's inside this pulpit or something. No, it's not talking about that. When it says God may be all in all, what, what we're meant to see and what we're meant to interpret is that all things are dependent on God. All things are dependent on God. God is all in all. Okay. So let's then turn to another practical application. We, we went down deep. Now we got to come up, take a deep breath, everybody. We'll come up for a practical application. Our practical application today is a simple one. Number one, take courage and confidence in the resurrection of the dead. All those who believe in Jesus have a rock-solid, sure fact hope, right, that the resurrection will happen. It's grounded in history and in a real fact. Second, all those who believe in Jesus, who have received his grace by faith, who have been born again, who receive him as Lord and Savior, will be raised to eternal life. All those who are doomed to destruction, those who do not believe in Jesus, are doomed to eternal damnation. Let us then live our lives in a way that broadcasts with great courage that God wins. General practical, practical application, let's make it real specific. When people who are close to you are dying... 
when people close to you have died. Grief is normal. Yet we live with a joy if they are believers in the resurrection. We, we have this struggle of, of grief and complete and utter joy. Why? Because there's confidence that they will be raised from the dead and we will see them again. When we are battling our own terminal illnesses... We do not face all of the choices as if this earth is the only thing that matters. It's not. This is not the end. We face our, our terminal illnesses with this rock-solid, sure hope fact that I will be raised from the dead for eternity. And whether or not I'm able to get an extra two, three, five years, or five or six months, in the end, it's going to be all right because I'll have an extra kabillion, quadrillion years to the square root of quadrillion, kabillion, right? I mean, we'll be alive for eternity in Christ. That changes then how we live. It changes our priorities. It changes how we treat our loved ones. And for those who have lost loved ones who are not in the faith, you know the grief and the guilt and the burden of it. Did I share Christ enough? Or did I fail? Share Christ. Live for God. Face death with joy, even in the midst of grief. Why? Because we have knowledge and courage and eternal joy in the rock-solid hope that Jesus is resurrected. So we will too. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this good news. Lord Jesus, I pray that each and every person might be encouraged and upbuilt and strengthened by this sermon. May people feed on the good news of the resurrection of Christ. And Father, we're so thankful that you have won and will win. Lord, what can we say but Jesus come? In your name do we pray. Amen.